So welcome to the 2015 version of MSK Boards Prep, 50 more real life cases. Um, we're gonna go through cases pretty quickly here. And just as you see the case, just try to come up with some ideas about what you might say or type into the computer screen at the boards test. Um, by way of setup here, here's the first case. Uh, you're gonna see this image of a object and try to decide <clears throat> what it is, of course. And so then what I'll do is I'll go through the findings as I see them. Um, frontal photograph, a canine, long brown hair, some sub-features, shiny nose. Um, so that's differential diagnosis. Would it could include something broad like a dog? You might recognize a specific dog like Lassie. That would be wrong. Uh, this is my dog, Buster. Um, so, <clears throat> and then at the end, I'll hit like on a key point, like it's, uh, if there is one that I think is relevant, like uh, Specific diagnosis is good if you just have one diagnosis, but if you have a differential diagnosis, that's totally fine as well, okay? So let's dig into the real cases here. So here's the first case, and I don't have them numbered, but I'll just kind of pause on them for a minute and uh, let you take a look, and then we'll go through the, uh, the answers here. Okay, so here's kind of the iconic image. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is fragmentation along this iliac crest in this skeletally immature patient. And this part's avulstoff. And so this is avulsion of the anterior superior iliac spine. And he's avulstoff a little bit of his apophysis as well. Key point about this case is that it's fairly common in adolescence and the muscle origin there is the sartorius. Okay, <clears throat> next case. Fifty-five-year-old woman. Hopefully, you can easily see the abnormality. I, you know, try not to show cases that are extremely subtle visual cases. Here's some additional images, and in some cases, I'll tell you what the pull sequence is. In many cases, I don't. But um, here's like pre and post contrast, for example. There's a lobular bright T2 mass here in the intrinsic musculature of the foot. Uh, it doesn't have much mass effect for its size. It's kind of infiltrating within the muscle here. And it showed some mild enhancement on the contrast enhanced scan. So you want to think, okay, this is, looks like a soft tissue tumor, um, so to speak. Actually, it has a really good appearance for a vascular malformation. And the reason is that uh, vascular malformations tend to not show much mass effect. They can be fairly large and infiltrate a muscle, but really not displace muscle and things like that. So this is a pretty classic vascular malformation. Next case. Here's some additional images. Okay, so what do we have here for findings? Um, we have a coronal MRI and some radiographs, right? Hopefully if you, can, you can figure that out. There's a hypo-intense focus in the supraspinatus tendon. We don't see any obvious cuffed hair here. There's this calcification on the radiograph. So this is a pretty classic example of calcific tendonitis, hydroxyapatite deposition disease. Um, one mildly useful point about this is that it's very rare to actually have a full thickness tear of the tendon when you identify HADD. There may be partial thickness tearing, but usually patients present with pain before the cuff is uh, completely torn. <laughs> Next case, 65-year-old man, right hip pain. A representative image. <clears throat> So we're seeing a lot of cortical thickening along this femur, right? Very thick cortex, probably overall expanded. There's coarse trabeculae, and it's a long zone of involvement, almost the, all the bone that I'm showing here. There's not too many things that will do that. Um, this is Paget disease. Uh, potentially, you could see something like this with a chronic infection. Um, when I give a differential diagnosis, I'll tend to 
italicized the one that we think is the actual true diagnosis here. So a tumor would be unlikely in this situation because of the extremely long extent of involvement. I suppose potentially you could get something like lymphoma that would do that. There's also really no destructive change in this case that would make it uh, look like a definitely aggressive lesion. Next patient, 36-year-old woman with a lump on the hand. Okay, and as we go through these, of course, you can just mentally think what you would describe if you were taking the case live, but um, we'd probably only get through about 10 cases if we had them all kind of taken one by one. Kind of lets you off the hook, too. I have to take the cases. All right. <clears throat> Representative images. Okay, so hopefully you see this soft tissue nodule here along the thumb. There's really no bony erosion. There is contrast enhancement. Maybe tough to tell, but this is a contrast enhanced scan. So it's a solid nodule. Um, so differential diagnosis. You got a soft tissue nodule, probably a neoplasm, right? This one turns out to be a common entity, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. They can be nodular like this. Um, you could think about something that's more uh, aggressive or neoplastic as well, like something like a, a sarcoma, potentially something like a fibroma that would be more of a, a benign scar type thing. Um, but when you see a solid lesion like this, it basically needs to have a tissue diagnosis because we know that soft tissue masses, uh, even though if they look well-defined, they may be aggressive and baby malignant. All right, next case here of a 41-year-old woman. We have these bilateral hand views. And the ball catcher's view here. And I'm going to zoom in here on this uh, to help you out. <clears throat> so this is from left hand, fourth finger, right hand, second finger. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing some, some abnormalities here. Um, focusing on that right hand index finger, there's a lot of swelling, right? Soft tissue swelling of the whole digit. There's erosions involving the MCP region, PIP, <clears throat> and the DIP. Um, there may be a little bit of periosteal reaction here along the proximal phalanx. Notice that the bone density is preserved. And when we had the other hand, it's a bilateral process, so probably systemic process, yet it's um, somewhat asymmetric. So we could tell this is an inflammatory process and think about the inflammatory arthropathies, whether it's rheumatoid or the seronegatives. The DIP involvement pretty much rules out rheumatoid, so this is a really good case of psoriatic arthritis. Okay, DIP involvement, kind of got that sausage <clears throat> digit. <clears throat> Remember, and, and psoriatic has all these different buzzwords with it, sausage digit, uh, DIP involvement's common, you can have that periosteal reaction. You can have pencil in a cup deformity if it's um, more advanced. Next case, uh, it's an older man, I guess in his 60s. I don't have the exact age on here. Knee pain. All right, so here's our representative image. Sagittal image of the knee. It's a pretty pretty straightforward case. This is just disruption of the quadriceps tendon, right? Quad tendon coming down here, fluid filled gap, patella. Um, so high grade tearing of the quad tendon, quad tendon rupture, uh, fairly common abnormality that we see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tends to be in uh, you know middle age to older folks. Often happens doing something like going down the stairs. Patients that have diabetes, uh, pre-existing tendon problems are probably at higher risk to get this. 40-year-old man with trauma. Okay, films from the emergency room. ER doc calls you up and says, what do you think about that wrist? Okay, so here's some zoomed in images. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see that there's uh, 
disruption of the carpal arcs here and displacement of this bone, which is what bone? Lunate, okay, so there's carpal arc disruption. There's palmar dislocation of the lunate. This is the pisiform here. So this is a lunate dislocation, okay? Fairly common injury. It's a high, in high energy injury, and you may well have associated fractures with it. The key thing to really recognize is that on this, it's a little bit of an oblique view, but there's kind of a pie shape to the lunate, showing you that it's, it's rotated relative to its normal position. It should be collinear with the scaphoid and those arcs of galula that we should look for. 54-year-old man with elbow pain. All right, um, so here's the representative image. We see a lot of thickening and edema within this tendon, right? That's the common flexor tendon. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm, I made a mistake. That's the extensor tendon on this one. Um, so that's a typo, but there's no fluid filled gap here because this is the radius here. Um, that's lateral. There's no bone marrow edema. So differential diagnosis could, could be tendinopathy, um, some degeneration of the tendon. It's probably more of a partial tearing of a moderate grade here because there's quite a bit of increased signal within that tendon. And this would be fitting for a lateral epicondylitis. So that's, again, I'll, I'm sure I'll get feedback on my channel. That's the extensor tendon. Um, and so the key point here is that epicondylitis is not really an ideal term because it's not really a bony abnormality. It's really a tendinous abnormality. And you may get irritation of the epicondyle of the humerus, um, either medially or laterally, because of the inflammatory process, but it's more of a tendinous problem, okay? <clears throat> Next case. Pretty young patient with pain in the finger, okay? Look at this representative image. Okay, so what do we have? We have a lucent lesion <clears throat> involving the distal phalanx. It has a sclerotic border. It's a little bit expansile, and it's subungual. Anybody have an idea what this is? Glomus tumor. Yeah, glomus tumor. Okay, you can speak. You're allowed to speak. You'll be on, be on YouTube for eternity, but um, along with me. So this is actually a glomus tumor. It was surgically proved. Um, they're not very common, so... Um, I wanted to show this case. You could think of other things. You could think about an infection, something under the nail bed, potentially a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath that was affecting the bone, although it'd be, it'd be tricky for that to actually get under the nail. Um, an epidermoid inclusion cyst could go and involve the, the bone. Something like an enchondroma would not be very likely in this setting because it's got this sclerotic border and it's so uh, round and distal. So these are subungual. They can be really painful. They can be quite small and kind of elusive to diagnosis. So MRI is used to look for them, and ultrasound can actually be helpful to look for small lesions as well because they're quite vascular. Next case of a 75-year-old woman with heel pain. Pretty easy, okay. Um, go into the iconic image here. Um, you've got some bone marrow edema in the calcaneus. You have thickening of this plantar fascia, some edema adjacent to the fascia. You don't see a discrete tear. Plantar fasciitis, right? Pretty straightforward. So I definitely try to show some, some bread and butter type cases as well as the little trickier cases. So this almost always involves the medial or the so-called intermediate cord of the plantar fascia as opposed to lateral. Okay, and it tends to be proximal, commonly associated with a little bit of bone marrow edema that's reactive. <clears throat> Here's the next patient, 34-year-old man with ankle and foot pain. You get some nice radiographs. Hopefully you can see some hint of an abnormality here. Okay, he also had this MRI study. 
the things are sort of more obvious on here. Okay, so <clears throat> what do we see? There's a prominent sustentaculum tailae here on the radiograph. That's the so-called C sign here. And if you look at the MRI, there's continuous bone between the talus and the calcaneus here. So this is a big subtalar bony coalition, okay? And then in addition to that, he's got some abnormality in the lateral talar dome here. So it may be because he's got a rigid hind foot that puts more stress on the ankle and he gets some chondral degeneration or an osteochondral lesion of that lateral talar dome, okay? So key point is those uh, people with a, a rigid hind foot may be at more risk for ankle injuries. That's not that critical for a radiologist, but um, it's the looking for things like these coalitions in the um, hind foot that are developmental. They may be either bony or cartilaginous or fibrous. This one looks like it's bony. Next victim here, 33-year-old woman coming through the bone board. Clinical history given is hand, two views. A little bit of a strange appearance here. So uh, you may notice that these fourth and fifth metacarpals are very um, <clears throat> short compared to the other metacarpals. There's a little bit of a deformity of the distal radius here as well. Um, so this is actually a patient with Turner syndrome, and this is a classic differential that I, I hate these things. What are the causes of fourth and fifth short metatar metacarpals? So Turner syndrome, remember that's 45X um, genotype. Um, you can get it with hypoparathyroidism, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, occasionally post-traumatic or idiopathic. Probably Turner's is the one to remember. Um, it's one of these entities now that you can easily just look it up if you don't remember what the differential is. Right? So short fourth and fifth metacarpals. <clears throat> Next patient, 67-year-old man. I have several um, imaging studies on this patient. There's that one. Here's some focused in views of the left hip. Um, here's a pelvic CT scan. Findings are a little bit subtle, but hopefully you're seeing some asymmetry here. <clears throat> Here's a skull radiograph. We love these. See if you see a Mondini malformation or anything in the temporal bone. Focus kind of back in this area here. Okay. So here's the package of images. Does anybody kind of come up with a uh, unifying diagnosis here? Not necessarily. Okay. That's okay. It's a little tricky. Like I said, so what do we see? Um, well, <clears throat> the femur and the right hemipelvis are showing this coarse trabeculations, right? See the right innominate bone compared to the left and the left femur? And in the skull, there's this big area of geographic lucency. So this, guy, this patient's got some areas of coarse trabeculae, some sclerotic areas, and some lytic areas as well. And it's an older man. It could potentially be something like a, a systemic disease, like a mastocytosis. Usually that's going to be more uniform, though, and this is involving different areas of the skeleton. Paget disease. Excellent. So, yeah, good, good job, Ethan. So that's this is Paget disease. We don't see that much of it here, but it's a pretty good look for it with those coarse trabeculae and things like that. Um, Lytic versus sclerotic phases, and you have mixed types as well. This patient has some lytic change involving the calvaria here in the uh, occipital region and some sclerotic areas involving the, the pelvis. Okay, next one, 51-year-old man with pain. 
Okay, so here's our representative image. What do we see? So there's edema along the lateral aspect of the knee. You may have recognized this as the iliotibial band here, and this edema is deep to it. <clears throat> so this is basically the MR equivalent of iliotibial band friction syndrome. A lot of edema deep to the IT band. You may have it superficial. Um, the key thing about this syndrome is that you know, it may be diagnosed clinically pretty easily, but the, um, the symptoms can overlap with those of a lateral meniscal tear. So that's often why the MR is done is to rule out a meniscal tear not so much to rule in the IT band friction syndrome. Very good. Okay, next patient, 26-year-old after a motorcycle crash. All right, hopefully you're looking at the carpal rose here, scaphoid, lunate, triquitrum, carpal alignment here. <clears throat> Here's the zoomed in images. All right, so what do we see? All right, several things, right? There's a displaced fracture of the scaphoid here. There's abnormal alignment of the lunate. You can see that here on this um, PA view. And then here on the lateral view, you can see the lunate is tilted forward and you've got loss of the articulation here. This lunate should be articulating with the capitate. So this is um, a scaphoid fracture and the, actually the whole carpus is dislocated somewhat dorsally here. The lunate is dislocated or at least subluxed palmarly. So this would be considered a perilunate dislocation. Some people say like a trans scaphoid perilunate dis dislocation. Um, what'll happen is if this progresses further and or the, the carpus itself relocates anteriorly, then the lunate can pop all the way out and that becomes actually then a lunate dislocation. It's kind of a spectrum from perilunate all the way to lunate dislocation. Okay, so these carpal disruption patterns are something you really need to um, <clears throat> pay attention to and try to sort out when you see the plane films. Okay, next patient, 67 year old woman with a mass. Okay, not, not um, subtle. Here's an additional imaging study on her. Bunch of little abnormalities. Here's some uh, MR pre and post contrast. Showing that there is a little bit of enhancement around this soft tissue mass. <clears throat> okay, so here's the findings. Older patient mass lesion, some erosive change involving the distal ulna here, big mass on MRI. <clears throat> so those are the main findings. Any ideas? Gout. Okay, excellent. Yeah, this is a pretty classic case of gout. You could have other focal synovial masses that are erosive. The main two ones to think about when you have soft tissue nodules like this or TOFI and things like that are gout and rheumatoid arthritis. There's not that many other things that give you these big soft tissue lumps associated with erosive change. <clears throat> okay, next patient, 52 year old woman with pain. Hopefully you're seeing the abnormality here. Here's a representative image. So hopefully you see the sclerosis involving the lunate. The alignment's actually pretty good in this case. There's negative ulnar variance. The ulna's a little bit short. We don't see a fracture. What's this called? Keenbox or Kindbox disease or Malaysia or whatever. <clears throat> Think about a boxer like involving the hand and wrist, that's how you can re remember that it's that box, cane box. Um, and it can represent AVN of the lunate. And so that's what you wanna look for when you see negative ulnar variance is abnormal sclerosis. And as it gets advanced into fragmentation of the lunate, um, often the fractures are in the coronal plane. So they're kind of in plane with this image, so they can be difficult to see. So you wanna carefully scrutinize the lateral views and sometimes CT um, for that disorder. So. <clears throat> 
relatively common disorder. Next patient, I have CT scout images because she was just imaged on um, CT and not on um, plain film as far as the uh, spine goes here. All right, here's the CT reformations. Here's some cross sections from the CT. This is a pretty young patient, I think, it's in the 30s or something like that. All right, so what do we what do we see here? Crazy looking bones, right? <clears throat> it's one of the reasons you don't go into skeletal radiology. Um, there's increased density of the bones, right, in general. <clears throat> there's also kind of a funny look of having like picture in a picture or bone within a bone here. There's no actual fracture or traumatic injury. Any ideas? Pseudo hyperparathyroid. It could be something crazy like that. Boy, now you're getting on me to. How about uh, osteopetrosis? Really rare, but very, very dense bones. That bone within a bone thing is common. As was brought up a minute ago in that Paget case, when you see these diffuse bone sclerotic disorders, you want to think of things like hematologic disorders that could include things like myelofibrosis, systemic mastocytosis. Uh, hypervitaminosis D, which we're not going to see very often, um, diffuse metastatic disease. Um, osteopetrosis is an even rarer disorder. It's the only case I have. You know, it's genetic, <clears throat> get very dense bones. It's called marble bone disease or Albert Schoenberg disease. And one thing to know about it is that even though the bones are really very dense radiographically, they actually tend to be brittle. So patients are at higher risk for fracture if they have osteopetrosis. Okay, next case, 20-year-old man with hip and heel pain, multiple areas of pain. Um, a few more images. Here's his heel region. All right, a little bit of a tricky case here. Multi multiple areas of abnormality. Hopefully you're seeing some <clears throat> abnormality in this left SI joint, a little bit of edema along there. This left hip has some edema, edema along the calcaneus. So these are all, um, at least the this and this are like apophyses. They're all at um, antheses in places of ligament or tendon attachments. <clears throat> so you could think about sacroiliitis with this uh, SI joint. If you just had that in isolation, you want to think about infection uh, for a unilateral sacroiliac problem. But you want to recognize that this whole package represents enthesopathy and different entheses that are inflamed. So this patient actually has ankylosing spondylitis, and this is like the MR equivalent of those areas of enthesitis. Okay. Pretty uncommon to see this. Uh, mainly because I think those patients don't get MRI scanned that often, but I have seen this several times, and it's just good to realize that when you see that, kind of atypical areas of what may be considered inflammation, or you could think of bone contusion at different sites, that it could be inflammatory and relate to these tendon or ligament um, attachments as well, okay? <clears throat> Pretty uncommon. Um, it could be, you could potentially see something like that with more a, a non-ankylosin spondylitis, like a reactive arthritis, like what used to be called Ryder syndrome as well. Yeah, so that's a good point. It probably broadened the differential to those seronegative um, kind of spondyloarthropathies. Okay, here's a 32-year-old man with some knee swelling. All right, here's the corresponding MRI. Good, I see some heads that are nodding like you nail the diagnosis on the plain film, which is good. <clears throat> so 
this one is pretty obvious, hopefully. Um, you can see that there's um, <clears throat> there was patella alta on the x-ray. The, the patella was too high. There's disruption of the patellar tendon here at the, uh, at the, at the uh, proximal portion. So this is basically a patellar tendon tear. This is a pretty high grade one, probably complete because the patella is elevated up. And um, these, these tend to occur in patients who have had some pre-existing proximal patellar tendinopathy or jumper's knee unless they're involved with some really high energy injury. All right, next patient, 54-year-old man with low back pain. Coming across the bone board, it's like four o'clock. There's like 200 cases left to go. <laughs> the resident says, can I just say lots of DJD? Uh, looks a little suspicious, right? So there's, you know, there is the usual DJD here probably, but um, <clears throat> let's look at another imaging study on this patient as well. Okay, so MRI, a lot of abnormality here at, um, I'm gonna go back to the radiograph here. So here's L1, 2, focusing on that disc space there. So here's the iconic images. So mainly we're seeing, we're seeing loss of the cortical margin of the L2 vertebral body here. A lot of marrow edema and enhancement on the MRI. It's crossing the disc space. So what's this representing? Yeah, discitis and osteomyelitis, something we definitely don't want to miss. So you want to be careful to look for that end plate erosion, especially if the patient has other signs of infection or risk factors for infection, like if they're diabetic and so on. So when we do the MR in this setting, the IV contrast is very helpful because you want to look for paraspinous abscess, and you also want to be conscious that sometimes patients will get an epidural abscess, which could be a surgical emergency, although it's usually treated um, Usually this is disorder is treated non-surgically unless they have a mass effect and uh, epidural abscess. <clears throat> Very good. Okay, 27-year-old man after a motorcycle crash. Okay, heads are nodding. You're all over it. Nailed it. Um, very good. So here's the image. I, it's like... Yay, fracture, fractured radius. Well, and so what else do you want to look for in this case? What else do you see? Dislocation of this joint here, the distal radio ulnar joint. Excellent. So the ring concept. So that's the Galeazzi fracture, right? Last year I showed the Montasia. This year the Galeazzi. There's no overlap between last year and this year, by the way. <clears throat> Remember that mugger thing? So Montasia goes with the ulna, Galeazzi with the radius, and that's the fracture. Okay, that's one convenient way to remember the, the eponyms. Here's a 22-year-old woman with a runner with some heel pain. May walk by this, no pun intended. Um, looks pretty good, but slightly abnormal. So here's the MRI scan that was done <clears throat> around the same time. Okay, so here's our representative images. So what do we see? Band of sclerosis on the radiographs. Here's the low signal line on MRI. There was a lot of edema around it on the T2-weighted images. So it's basically a calcaneal stress fracture. Okay, pretty straightforward. So the key point here is that... Um, the radiographs may still be normal when the MRI is abnormal, and so MRI is much more sensitive. When the radiographs do show up positive, they tend to have this band of somewhat ill-defined sclerosis there where you're getting these like little calluses along the, the trabeculae. Another young patient, 13-year-old boy with pain after soccer. Take a look at that image. Okay, let's look at this zoomed in image here. Anything abnormal? So there's this bony thing right here, right? <clears throat> so if I go back to the big image, like here's the right hip, here's this thing on the left hip. 
So there's an ossific density, superlateral left acetabulum. What could that be? <clears throat> this is actually avulsion of this anterior inferior iliac spine. So it's a kind of a companion case for that other kid that avulsed the anterior superior iliac spine. It's possible this could be just a big os acetabulae, like a developmental ossicle. We don't know for you know without the history, um, or it could be part of a larger fracture that I put occult because just maybe that's difficult to see. So you'd want to have that that clinical history of the you know sports injury and just isolated to that area to know that it's just an avulsion. So this is actually the rectus femoris origin here, not the sartorius. All right. Next case, 24-year-old man with pain in the shoulder. If you heads nodding there, okay, it generally looks pretty good. Come to this axillary view. Anybody seeing anything abnormal? He's pretty well aligned here. <clears throat> But what you should see is this lucent line across the acromion there, a little bit of sclerotic borders to it. So what's that called? Osochromiali. Okay, so that should fuse in in uh, late childhood or young adulthood, and they can be unstable. They can be symptomatic in some patients, and they're important if patients get rotator cuff surgery because if they're if they're not fused on a bony basis, it can actually destabilize that that um, kind of synchondrosis there. So it's important to recognize that <clears throat> as, a, as a kind of a normal variant of not fusing, but um, potentially could be leading to symptoms down the road. Next patient, young, young man, young boy, 14 years old with low back pain. Okay, let's look at another uh, set of images on this patient. There's an MR scan. All right, a little bit of a tricky case. <clears throat> There's a lesion here, right? Hopefully you saw that. Hopefully you see the edema on the MRI and the lesion there. So descriptively, lucent lesion, kind of left sacral area, upper sacrum, extensive sclerosis around it. It does have some internal calcifications. There's edema around it, and the lesion enhances on MRI. Any ideas? 14-year-old boy. Excellent. Okay, so osteoidosteoma was really, really good thought, or osteoblastoma. And um, <clears throat> you wouldn't be thinking about malignant things that commonly in a young kid like that. So this turns out to be an osteoblastoma. And the differentiator is that it's bigger than an osteoidosteoma, like two centimeters or so size. You might consider, you know, trying to put down a differential of a chondroid neoplasm, like a and chondroma, but that really should not have this much reactive sclerosis or edema. So it's almost like an ant mini kind of a case. Um, they tend to involve the posterior elements in the spine. Um, and so this is just really nice case of an osteoblastoma. 39 year old woman with history of lupus and pain in the thighs. Pretty much just like a day on the bone board here, isn't it? The richness of the cases. <laughs> Stable post-op, follow-up, totally up, next. <clears throat> okay, here's some representative images. So there's like lots of edema involving muscles here, both bilateral thigh muscles. Um, <clears throat> you can see this is the post-contrast image Actually, I think this is the T2. There's extensive edema within the, the quadriceps, somewhat in the posterior musculature. Some areas on the contrast did not enhance very well. So this is a pretty diffuse process of like extensive myositis. 
it may be areas of myonecrosis or early myonecrosis where it's not enhancing. You could see something like this, just, you know, nonspecific myositis inflammatory change or like with potentially like a dermatomyositis that was very, very um, advanced. Um, but this was probably related to her vasculitis. Um, we, I don't want to get into the whole necrotizing fasciitis, fasciitis issue, but this is involving a lot of muscle. It's not necessarily focused in on the fascial planes, um, and it's hard to detect gas on MRI. But um, if we saw soft tissue gas, which CT would be better for detecting that, that would be more of a, a necrotizing fasciitis kind of a picture. <clears throat> Young man with an axillary mass, a little bit of motion artifact on some of the images, pulsatility, but here's pretty obvious mass here. Pre-contrast, post-contrast. Okay, here's some representative images. Big lobular, fluid-filled looking mass. It has rim enhancement, not much internal complexity. It does have some septations, but not like nodularity or solid components. Any ideas? Excellent, Ibrahim, lymphangioma. <clears throat> um, not too many other things that should it should be. Uh, could potentially be a seroma or something like a simple collection post-op. Um, <clears throat> and um, doesn't look like a vascular malformation, right? Because it doesn't have as much enhancement. It has these large, large pockets of fluid within it. So fairly uncommon lesion, but... Um, <clears throat> Pretty good look for a lymphangioma. Next patient, older, well, not that old anymore, 56-year-old man with thigh swelling. So we got the x-ray of T1. I think that's a T2 fat set here, and this is a post-GAD T1 fat set, <clears throat> okay? All right. Big mass, bone and fat on the radiograph. You can see the low density on the radiography here. The MR shows fat signal within it with some complexity. Some of that's the bone formed within the lesion. Some of it may be soft tissue stranding. Diagnosis, <clears throat> liposarcoma, right? Fatty mass, big mass, forming bone complexity. And so it's good to remember when we look at radiographs that you may be able to detect macroscopic fat on those as well. <clears throat> Here on this oblique view, you can actually see there's a lot of fat within this lesion. It wouldn't be where you'd stop with the diagnosis, but it's kind of cute to be able to look for that. <clears throat> All right, 19-year-old woman with fever, history of bone marrow transplant. Lots of problems here, right? Multifocal bony abnormalities about the knee. There's a lot of soft tissue edema around the femur. Um, what kinds of things should we think about in this patient with history of bone marrow transplant, fever, um, actually had leukemia? And this is a case that actually turns out to be these chloromas, these leukemic masses within bone. Quite uncommon, but it actually can be, you know, tumors of white cells, most commonly in AML. Having said that, <clears throat> you have that clinical picture of fevers, um, pain, you definitely want to think about, could this be areas of infection and potentially areas of, of bone infarction in some areas? So this is the only case I have of these chloromas, and so it's quite an uncommon thing. And just think about acute myelogenous leukemia where patients get extremely high white counts that they can get these focal collections of white cells even within the bone. They're called chloromas because I guess they kind of have a tend to have a, a greenish tint to them macroscopically like chlorine. 
All right, 58-year-old man with a lump on his foot. Sagittal, short axis, pre and post contrast here. Here's the representative images. So here's this little area of mass. Here it is on the fluid sensitive sequence. Kind of fusiform mass. It's intrinsic to the plantar aponeurosis, kind of along the plane of the plantar fascia here. <clears throat> it enhances, so it's a solid mass. Ideas? Classic appearance of plantar fibromatosis, right? Kind of the same thing as a desmoid tumor. Um, it's the same disorder that you can get with um, uh, Dupitron's contracture in the hand, this uh, benign fibromatous tumors that um, can be locally aggressive. One point I always make when I show foot cases is uh, with something on the plantar soft tissues, this probably wouldn't fit perfectly, but just always remember to ask, you know, if there could have been a history of a foreign body, stepped on a nail, something like that, that could be leading to a, a chronic foreign body reaction or a granulomatous kind of reaction. 22-year-old <clears throat> unstable knee. Very quick. Takes a lot of concentration to stay with these cases, doesn't it? So here's the representative images. So you should see this increased signal within the posterior cruciate ligament. There's a little discontinuity right here. <clears throat> On the axial images, you, there are sections that as you go through it, you don't see the PCL as this thick black cord. So this is basically just a PCL tear. All right. That should be pretty straightforward to you. These are usually treated non-operatively still, um, unless there's an ACL tear and a PCL tear. They still usually reconstruct the ACL, but not necessarily the PCL. Okay. 43-year-old young man, bilateral shoulder pain. All right, <clears throat> here's an advanced imaging study. A couple of them here. This is left shoulder MRI, C-spine MRI. Put the whole case together, right? Awesome. So he's got bilateral shoulder arthropathy. He's a fairly young patient, 40s. Um, got this big syrinx here. So this is like the one case I've ever seen of the actual neuropathic like arthropathy, presumably due to a syrinx in the cervical spine. So <clears throat> we talk about this, right? So this, the point about this case is it actually does occur. Um, unlike some things in radiology we talk about that you actually never will see. <clears throat> this actually does it, or at least this may be the one case you ever see as well. <clears throat> okay, next case, 48-year-old man with knee pain. All right, <clears throat> hopefully you're seeing the abnormality here. It's a differential diagnosis case, MRI. Hmm, okay. What are you going to do? Clinical history said knee, frontal and lateral ASAP. <clears throat> okay, so here we have a lucent lesion or lytic lesion in the proximal tibia. It has somewhat sclerotic borders. We can tell that it's eroding the cortex here on the axial view. Um, it's kind of lobulated. It doesn't seem to have internal matrix like chondroid matrix. Um, you might say, well, it's a little ground glassy, perhaps. Um, it's important that it doesn't seem to go up and reach the joint, right? It um, doesn't get subarticular. So you end up with this pretty broad differential of a focal bone lesion <clears throat> in the uh, in, in this patient. So you, you could think about a bone cyst uh, just based on the radiographic appearance um, the at plain x-ray, but then we know on the MR that it's not fluid filled, it's more heterogeneous than that. So you might also think of something like fibrous dysplasia for this look. Um, you'd want to say, well, this is not going to be a giant cell because it doesn't get up to the articular surface. 
And it's not going to be an enchondroma because it shouldn't have these sclerotic borders and it should have matrix in it if it's an enchondroma. So this one turns out to be a chondromyxoid fibroma, rare case. Um, mainly it's if you see a case like this, you see a pretty big lesion, you see that MR appearance, you basically know that this patient needs like attention, right? It's not like an incidental bone island, no, it, nothing, nothing else needs to be done with it. So um, needs to be seen by an orthopedic specialist and get the thing biopsied and treated appropriately. <clears throat> So it's rare, but this is a fairly, uh, I would say, a fairly typical appearance of this rare type of a lesion. Okay, young man, hip pain. Pretty good. He gets an MRI arthrogram. Okay, we seem to be doing a lot of these these days. So here's his radiograph, here's the MR arthrogram. <clears throat> and so I showed this because I wanted to illustrate this very prominent femoral head neck junction. Um, he may have cranial acetabular retroversion where you see the posterior wall and then the anterior wall crossing over up here. It's always a little bit subtle. He has a tear of the superior labrum here. So this is basically compatible with femoral acetabular impingement, right? This guy's developmentally a setup for impingement because he's got this big bony prominence of the cam type. Um, he probably does have a little acetabular retroversion here. And so most often, you know, younger men are going to get the cam type impingement, women pincer type with a deeper socket. You can often have mixed types, though he has some cam features with the prominent head neck junction. There may be some degree of this pincer element with um, <clears throat> crossover, but um, FAI, a very common, commonly diagnosed disorder these days. All right, 51-year-old man, pain after water skiing. Proximal hamstrings here. All right, hopefully you're seeing this intermediate signal in the proximal hamstrings. They should be nice and black here. Edema around them and within them on the T2-weighted scan. Partial tear, proximal hamstrings. <clears throat> Key point here, um, if you're trying to remember the order of the tendons, it's not critical to know, but it's like goes like MTB, mycobacterium tuberculosis, like semimembranosis, tendinosis, and biceps are a common uh, origin, MTB. So this would be more of the semimembranosis component of the tendons there. <clears throat> Okay, 38, chronic wrist pain. All right, so you've seen a lot of sclerosis within this proximal pole of the scaphoid here. There's a lucent line, there's a fracture across there, there's edema in the proximal pole on MRI. So this is a scaphoid fracture. It's probably a non-union, it's probably chronic because it looks like you know, it's it's been around for a while. The sclerosis of the proximal pole, it may represent AVN. You have to be careful about that diagnosis. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, you, you sometimes need to give intravenous contrast to see if the bone enhances there, because if you call it AVN, um, that means the bone can't really heal at all, whereas sometimes there's still some vascularity to the bone um, that that will allow it to heal with appropriate surgery. Okay, 69-year-old patient, patient pain after a fall. Nothing real obvious here. MRI. Okay. So <clears throat> hopefully your seat, you, you could tell there wasn't a definite fracture on the x-ray. There is this irregular low signal line. This is a proton density weighted MR, so you don't see the edema real well. But this is basically an intertrochanteric fracture that's a really kind of radiographically occult, or really subtle at least. And we just know that MR is really sensitive for these, even in the fairly acute setting, and it'll help determine whether the patient needs surgery or not if it goes all the way across the femur 
or if it's just a fracture isolated to the trochanter. Okay, young woman, uh, snowboarding injury. Radiographs of the ankle were done. Maybe there's a lucency here. Here's a CT, definite lucency. Under this lateral aspect of the talus. So that's just a fracture, right? And it involves this lateral talar process. Um, this is a so-called snowboarder's fracture. Okay, so that's just become a, a, a injury that's known to occur with snowboarding and other kind of similar sport activities. They can be somewhat easy to miss on plain film. That's why you want to be aware of that injury. All right, 53-year-old woman. X-ray, MRI. So hopefully you see this speckled calcific lesion in the proximal fibula. It's lobulated, high signal on T2 weighted scan, low signal internally to go along with the calcification. There's a little bit of um, endosial scalloping there. Diagnosis, chondroid, yeah, enchondroma. So I tend to call these low-grade chondroid lesions. Um, most of them are enchondromas, the benign type. The appearance can overlap with these low-grade chondrosarcomas, depending on the degree of aggressive features that we see. This one doesn't really have any definite aggressive features. Um, and the key thing to remember is that the histology is identical between those two lesions, enchondroma and low-grade chondrosarc, so it really relies on the imaging to determine whether it's malignant or not, or treated as a malignancy or not. All right, <clears throat> we're getting there, I think. Um, Popliteal fossa mass, 67 year old man. MR, here's ultrasound. I gather there's more ultrasound being shown on the boards. I don't have a lot of cases of that, but there's the mass with some vascularity to it. So the key thing to recognize is this is along this tibial nerve here. There's solid uh, flow within the lesion. Good for a peripheral nerve sheath tumor, right? Fairly common site. As I went through my teaching cases, I have like three or four cases of this schwannoma or neurofibroma involving the, the tibial nerve or um, common peroneal nerve, distal sciatic nerve behind the knee. <clears throat> Next case, 60-year-old man with hip pain. Maybe this thing's picked up incidentally here. Pretty well-defined lesion, sclerotic border, coarse internal calcification, pretty classic appearance for intraosseous lipoma, what we tend to call those. It could be a bone infarct, I suppose. It could be um, what we call a LSMFT, liposclerosing myxofibrous tumor which has kind of got fat in it, some sclerosis, and it's an entity that's maybe being reconsidered as to whether or not that's actually, in fact, a separate tumor or not, if they or if they just tend to be lipomas and so on. But you may hear that term, LSMFT. 41, swelling and pain in the elbow. A lot of irregularities there. Here's the MRI. Pretty abnormal, right? Radiocapitellar joint, all that fluid, extensive synovitis. So this looks like an inflammatory process, or hopefully should to you, an erosive arthropathy. This is rheumatoid arthritis, and it's fairly common in the elbow. So just extensive RA. 50-year-old <clears throat> man felt a pop in the arm. Okay, huge fluid collection, right? This squiggly thing here, distal radius, um, seeing some edema there, and 
what do you think popped biceps tendon right so this is rupture tear distal biceps tendon probably tore, pretty much torn off the bone there might be a little bit of a stump there so you want to look for and address the degree of retraction is it a complete tear incomplete tear is there a stump if present okay and we're almost done i realize if you have to go that's fine i'm just going to finish up so that the uh, online audience can can see the rest of it as well here later 62 year old woman with chest pain Lesion deep to the scapula here. Contrast enhancement. Okay, bit of an atypical or seemingly uncommon abnormality. It could be, you know, any kind of soft tissue mass potentially, but does anybody know what this is? Elastofibroma dorsi. <laughs> the elastin and stuff can cause like some brighter. Um, so it looks like fatty elements on the uh, cross-sectional imaging as well. So they can have fatty streaks with them, but they have elastin in them. Um, I'm not sure if that should be fatty, but that's what they are. It's a benign, probably a rela related to like chronic friction tend to occur in older uh, female patients. 19-year-old <clears throat> man. And maybe we'll have this be the last case because I think this is getting to be about number 50 here. <clears throat> Plain film, MR. More MR here with sagittal and axial images. Lesion along the distal femur. <clears throat> Contrast enhancing. It's kind of irregular on the radiograph here. It's probably got some bone to it, but it's got other areas of density that are not all contiguous with it. It looks kind of pretty irregular on the MRI. Um, so it's calcific. It's actually probably ossific. It's juxtacortical. It doesn't seem to involve inside the bone there, but there's a little bit of periosteal abutment here. Potentially could be myositis ossificans, but this one turns out to be a parosteal osteosarcoma. Okay. You got to be careful about that. That's the kind of surface lesion that has a little better prognosis to it. <clears throat> um, I would just say that this um, this lesion looks a little bit more irregular than typical myositis ossificans, and in the absence of history of trauma, you need to think about that periosteal osteosarcoma. So I think what I'll do is um, I'll stop there because we're like at an hour. I don't know how many cases we got to here, but um, this is a good um, endpoint. I'm just going to go down and show Buster again. That's the end point of the talk today. So that's a lot of cases, a lot of information, and I hope that it's um, useful to go through those just as a kind of a quick review of the um, different entities that you might see either clinically or on the boards. So thank you very much for your attention today.